In conjunction with studies of advanced spacecraft, General Dynamics Astronautics has developed configurations for use with both the Saturn 1B and Saturn 5 launch vehicles. One of the favored concepts designed for a lunar logistics system is the two-stage, low-finest ratio spacecraft bus. Unique in its design is the application of compact tankage. The compact tankage provides gains in design efficiency by effectively utilizing the available space within the basic vehicle structure. Design versatility is achieved by using toroidal, ellipsoidal, or cylindrical tank shapes. The compact tanks, when used in a Saturn 1B upper stage, contribute design advantages that greatly increase the third stage performance. When the concept is applied to the lunar spacecraft bus, in this case using toroidal tanks, it gives the touchdown vehicle a low center of gravity, high landing stability, and low structural weight. Compact tankage is equally suitable to single stage, one and a half, and two stage designs. In this case, a two stage design is shown with a dimension from the lunar surface to the payload floor of 12 and a half feet. It is extremely important to keep this dimension as low as possible in order to give various advantages to the design. These advantages include a light landing gear weight, ease of landing gear retraction, and a low structural weight for the landing stage. These advantages combine to give us a payload capability in excess of 8,000 pounds more than other arrangements. This curve shows the relation between landing gear weight. Theoretically, the compact tankage offered many design advantages. But in order to prove the concept's true value, the blueprint tanks had to be transformed into existing hardware that could be tested. Therefore, astronautics decided to manufacture a scale model propellant tank. The tank was to be fabricated in a toroidal shape. This design most readily satisfied the requirements for low finest ratio spacecraft applications. Also, a toroidal shaped test tank would be valuable for studying its propellant storage characteristics. The paid for a toroidal tankage is less than 15%. Here is the design of our test tank. This toroid is roughly five feet in diameter and one foot in section diameter. It is made up of several sections six sections uh, bolted together with removable flange attachments. It has internal baffles and two sumps, one on each side, for proper drainage. Now, I'd like to see this built from uh, 2219 aluminum alloy, T87. Uh, do we have any of that, Dave? Check with the uh, purchaser, and there's a six to eight week delivery for this material. However, we do have T81 in-house. We can start the program immediately using T81. Now, our manufacturing policy was put into effect through a manufacturing plan similar to one for production hardware. The plan included methods for documenting research and development activities and established quality assurance procedures. It also outlined the objectives for the tank development program. The main manufacturing objective was to fabricate the tank using manufacturing methods that could be applied to full-scale flight hardware production. This involved applying present-day manufacturing techniques to 2219 aluminum alloy. Little information was available concerning this material's properties when subjected to standard manufacturing processes. The forming of 60-degree toroidal tank segments, selective chem milling of tank walls, and automatic welding of thin gauge aluminum. Reviews of engineering design showed the first significant manufacturing problem to be forming the tank segment from 2219 T81 temper aluminum. When cup sample testing was attempted using a drop hammer and existing die, forming stresses on the material exceeded its rupture strength, causing it to tear. Available information and the work done at Astronautics indicated that it wasn't feasible to cold form the T81 material. Therefore, research and development activity began with the investigation of drop hammer hot forming as a method for making the tank segment. Special drop hammer punches were made using existing routine manufacturing techniques. These punches were needed to form the curved tank segments and the sump. 
Dye forgers first made a sand mold in the shape of the tank sump. After baking the mold, they removed the plaster dye and delivered the sand mold to the foundry. Molten kirksite poured over the mold formed the punch die for the hammer. Engineers used the drop hammer in a 10-day hot forming test. Technicians heated the 1 16th inch sheet stock to 375 degrees Fahrenheit. The cold hammer die then struck the hot metal. The parts did not fully form with one strike and were reheated and struck twice more. The results showed that the tank parts could be formed using existing equipment and hot forming methods. After forming, the segments were accurately trimmed using fiberglass master tools to hold trim accuracy to within the required tolerances. Engineers took tensile specimens of each part to ensure that the mechanical properties of the material were maintained. Machine planishing between strikes removed compression wrinkles from the segments. Drop hammer forming proved to be an effective economical method for test tank fabrication. However, other methods, such as explosive forming or stretch forming, could be applied for larger scale flight hardware. The formed tank segments then went to Chemtronics near San Diego for chem milling. A neoprene resin coating on the parts acted as a selective etching mask. The areas to be milled were outlined and the neoprene mask removed. A sodium hydroxide solution etched the exposed areas. It accurately milled the parts to the specified tolerances within five one thousandths of an inch. Chem milling gives an added versatility to design planning. It allows for varying thicknesses in the tank walls where needed. The areas near the butt weld can remain thick to reduce the stress level at the weld while other areas of the tank walls are reduced in gauge to remove excess weight from the tank. After selected chem milling, the entire surfaces of the tank segments were etched to reduce the overall weight of the pieces. When completed, the pieces, originally 63 thousandths in thickness, measured 25 thousandths in the thinnest walls and 50 thousandths in the thicker weld areas. While the tank segments were being etched, Machining of the tank's accessory hardware continued. Generally, present-day manufacturing technology was applied in making the detail parts. Baffles, tubing, flanges, and mounting rings were machined using standard drilling, lathe, and milling operations. To avoid duplication of machining, tests were run to determine whether the ring flanges would distort from welding and require refacing. The test showed that with the material gauges and welding techniques used, the weld heating was not sufficient to cause distortion. Therefore, the ring flanges were net machined and were complete before welding. Machinists found the 2219 T87 stock to have excellent machining characteristics. They experienced no difficulty in machining the detail parts. With component manufacturing completed, the next step was to assemble the tank section. Each section was made from two half-shell segments joined by longitudinal welds. An outer perimeter weld attached the mounting T-flange as a part of the tank wall. Two of the tank sections were made by butt welding 60-degree tank segments to make two 120-degree half-shells. Before the two half-shells were joined, the internal baffle mounts were welded. Manual welding was used to attach the two sumps, the inlet tube, and the three test camera mounting bosses to the tank wall. The final major weld joined the ring flanges to each end of the tubular sections. The tank welders used tungsten inert gas fusion welding to make the welds. Before any tank welding began, however, weld specialists made samples of test welds and evaluated them. The material used was the same gauge 2219 aluminum as that used for the tank part. The edges and surfaces in the weld zone were cleaned of all oxides. This tungsten inert gas welder automatically welded the material samples. The variables that control the quality of the weld were changed for each of the sample welds. These changes included the distance from the electrode to the material. 
voltage and amperage, and the speeds and wire feed rates. The right combination for the best quality weld was determined by X-ray inspection of the test weld. From these tests, engineers established a weld schedule as a guide for welding the tank part. While the weld schedule was being established, tooling for the automatic welding was completed. The close tolerances of the automatic welding demanded the use of permanent precision tooling. The curved shape of the toroidal segments also dictated the need for a precision fixture to accurately position the part during welding. Adequate tooling was considered the key to successfully welding the thin-gauged aluminum. With the tooling complete, welding of the tank segments began. The tungsten weld head, stationary above the workpiece, made the girth weld. The precision weld fixture revolved the work under the arc. A critical distance had to be maintained between the tungsten tip and the material surface. When welded, the segments formed a 120-degree curved half-shell section. The accurate permanent tooling played an important part in obtaining the Class III full penetration weld required for the pressurized propellant tanks. The automatic longitudinal welding also required a permanent weld fixture for precise part positioning and weld chilling. The tank half shells had to mate precisely to assure an accurate tubular diameter for the tank section. The half shell segments were clamped firmly from both sides with heavy-duty copper chill bars. Adequate tooling helped to produce good quality tanks and aided in developing welding techniques that could be applied to flight hardware. The longitudinal weld joined the segment half shells to form the tubular tank section. There were three welds. One joined the half shells at their inside perimeter. The other two attached the mounting key flange as an integral part of the tank wall. Production inspection methods were applied to the test program to maintain quality control. The welds were inspected using destructive and non-destructive testing. Coupons of sample metal from the same weld schedule were tensile tested to evaluate the material's mechanical properties. Tests were made at both ambient and cryogenic temperatures. Inspection with dye penetrants revealed any surface flaws, while X-ray inspection of every weld area showed the internal quality of the weld. The 100% X-ray inspection technique helped keep quality high. More than 90% of all welds made met class one requirements. The use of X-ray inspection and microphotography also helped in developing manual welding techniques for sump welding. The task of joint welding, the irregular shaped sump to the contoured tank wall, proved to be one of the major problems encountered in assembling the tank. The sump had to be attached with a full penetration fusion weld to meet the design requirements. To make this irregular joint weld would normally require elaborate tooling and numerically controlled automatic welding. Astronautics weld specialists accomplished the task using minimum tooling and manual welding techniques. Technicians made four attempts to weld the sump. The first two were fillet welds made from outside the tank using minimum tooling. Full penetration was achieved with the second attempt, but in both cases, the intense heat during welding caused extreme distortion. Through trial and error experimenting, a third method was evolved. The area of the tank wall which the sump would cover was cut out. This cutout piece was then attached to the inside of the sump part with a full penetration weld. The sump was then tack welded to the tank. The welders followed a developed weld sequence to minimize distortion. This two-step welding technique reduced the heat affected zone, narrowed the weld size, and reduced distortion. However, a distortion-free full penetration weld was difficult to achieve without adequate tooling to correctly position and chill the parts during welding. A special weld fixture was constructed for sump welding. The fixture's adjustable clamps held the sump in place during welding. Copper chill plates covered both the inside and outside surface of the tank segment. Because of the new fixture, the welders varied their weld procedure and tried to weld the sump from the outside. Later, X-ray inspection revealed that the weld had not reached full penetration. Apparently, the large chill plates had absorbed too much of the weld heat. The weld bead was then ground to penetration depth. 
an additional weld made from inside the tank achieved 100% penetration. The precision tooling helped reduce the heat affected zone and minimize distortion. The residual stress of the sump weld area indicates that research must continue so that a reliable technique can be developed for making the difficult joint weld. Ring flange welding was the last major step before final tank assembly. Ring flange welding revealed a production problem that had not been anticipated. The slightest variance in tank section diameter, even though within design tolerances, would multiply along the length of the section, causing distortion. The first flanges welded were out of alignment, and the tank sections would not fit together to form a circle. This master weld tool resolved the problem. It provided two flange alignment reference points simultaneously. Any distortion misalignment in the tank section was removed by trimming the end of the section using the flange face as a square reference line. Once aligned, the ring flanges were automatically welded. Once again, it was apparent that consistently good quality welds of the thin gauge 2219 aluminum alloy could best be obtained by using automatic DC welding and permanent precision tooling. After the ring flanges were welded, the tank sections were ready for final assembly. The tank sections were then cleaned to liquid oxygen specifications and were mechanically assembled and joined. The final step in assembly was to bolt the ring flanges together. The advantage of this method of assembly is that it allows access at any time to the baffles inside the tank. This permits greater flexibility in testing alternate baffle designs. Ring flanges acted as connecting interfaces between the sections. A metallic O-ring cryogenic seal on the ring flange face prevents propellant leakage. With the completion of tank assembly, Astronautics has demonstrated its ability to manufacture the complex-shaped toroidal tank. The first toroidal tank is now complete and ready for testing. But its successful completion is only the beginning of compact tankage development for low finance ratio spacecraft. In addition to the toroidal design, we are also studying compact tankage arrangements using ellipsoidal and cylindrical shape. These compact arrangements offer considerable gains in the design efficiency of future space vehicles. Translating these designs into flight articles will take further study and development. We believe the valuable production experience acquired on this model tank program can now be used for full-scale flight hardware. Along with manufacturing know-how, we have also gained a functional model tank, which can be used as a test tool for studying the structural properties of the toroidal design. Other tests with the tank will determine propellant flow effects and the dynamic and thermodynamic characteristics of this type of propellant storage system.